Hi, and welcome to a new uh, session in the Java Performance Pitfall series. This one is about improper logging. My name is Peter Paul Bakker. Um, in this uh, session, we're talking about Java logging. So here's an example uh, of, how, of what Java logging looks like. We see an example of uh, MDC. We see uh, logger.info call, and there's a catch exception that logs an error. We will come back to these lines later in this presentation. If we look at performance and logging, it's uh, obviously best for performance to do no logging at all. That will save uh, resources and time for the user. But we need logging because we need to know what is happening and we need it for troubleshoots when things go wrong. So we want to have just enough logging so we can do the troubleshoots and still have good performance. So we'll look at what is too much logging. We're going to have a look at how do you make efficient logging calls, what are pitfalls using the log context, when to apply asynchronous logging and how to do that, and last, we look at some inefficient log configuration settings. When is there too much logging? There's too much logging when the logging has a negative performance impact. If you have too many log lines you're, and you're writing to disk, your disk can run out of space. And if your disk runs out of space, uh, all sorts of system failures can happen. So you don't want to, to, that to happen. Um, also, when there is too much logging, the user has to wait for the logging to be written to disk. So it's actually increasing the user wait time. When there's a lot of logging, it also makes it hard to find what you're looking for. So when is there too much logging? For instance, when you log on an improper level. In this example, you see a loop of a, uh, a string. And for every car in that string, you write a log line on info level. This is obviously, obviously for debug purposes, so put this in a debug statement. If it's in debug statement, then you should also consider if this really needed. If you have statements saying, I'm here now, you can better remove them because it doesn't have any use. We've seen cases where there was a lot of CPU and I.O. On, uh, on production. And then we looked, and debug level logging was enabled. And they said, well, if we don't have debug, then we don't see what we want to see. So there we have a case of wrong log level. Um, you all should always use info or higher, but make sure that debug works. If you want to troubleshoot, then the system should not explode when you dynamically turn on debug logging in production. Sometimes we see log files with a lot of stack traces, and it happens that non-programming errors also print out stack traces. In this example, you see that user input is being validated, and if it's not a number, an error with a stack trace is printed, uh, because the exception is provided to the error. If it's user input validation, you do not want to print out the stack trace. So the best practice here is to have minimal logging, but provide enough context in your log lines so it's useful. Uh, if we look at systems, we count the number of log lines per request. And this gives a sense if there's a lot of logging or not a lo lot of logging. We expect a few lines per user request. If it's more, then reduce it. If you're doing the log line in debug uh, or any log line, then avoid the concatenation of strings. Concatenation is re relatively expensive. And in this case, you can see if the message is a real long string, then before the debug is called, the string is expanded into a very big string. So the best practice here is to use no string concatenation, 
And you can use the placeholders in SLF4J. So here the message will get passed as an object to the debug log line. And only when debug is enabled, the two string is called. So that will save you a lot of uh, memory and CPU. Another way to use conditional logging is to request the logger what debug level is enabled. If debug is enabled, you can do the calculation that you need for your debug statement. In this case, calculate the length of the message, which can be a heavy method. If debug is not enabled, so you're logging on info, then the steps are skipped. If you use the replacement variables, as in this example, then do not call the toString because that works against the efficiency that we just discussed in the previous slide. And also you have a chance that you create a null pointer here in this log line if end date is a null object. It's very convenient to use context while you're logging. So here we see an example of the mapped diagnostic context where you can put variables in your logging context and the user ID in this example will be printed out at every log line after this put. Be aware that putting things in the MDC uh, will cause, cost more memory because it's put on thread locals. And it can also leak into other requests because it is on the thread local and we make use of thread pools for all the requests. So when a new request comes in, the old user ID might still be there and that gives a lot of confusion. So the best practice is to always clean up your MDC values. So if you put the user ID, then in the finally remove that user ID so it's always cleared. Here we suggest that you use the single responsibility principle where if one class or method puts it in the context, it also is responsible to take it out. We've done some testing. Uh, normally uh, the log lines are written synchronously to a file or to a network, so the user has to wait for this I.O. You can also write the logging asynchronously where a separate thread will write to disk or to the network and the user does not have to wait for this. In logback you can use the async appender for this. If you use asynchronous logging, you have to be careful because now you will create an in-memory message queue where the messages, the log messages are being uh, held until they are written to disk. Uh, if that fills up, log lines might get lost. Also, additional information needs to be fed into the messages that is available on threads only. Think of the thread info and the context information. Uh, when the server shuts down, then there might still be log lines in the queue that need to be flushed first. Otherwise, when you shut the server down in case of an issue, you don't see the last log lines. And we advise if you use asynchronous mon uh, logging to monitor the queues to see if they fail up uh, when there's high load on the system. Here you see an example how to configure synchronous logging. So in this configuration example you see a logger that will reference the log appender that will write to a file. So if you want to introduce asynchronous logger, logging, you introduce an in-between appender, namely the async appender. You specify how large the in-memory queue should be and the async appender will route through the original file appender. If you have the log configuration and you have a look at it, you can check if you use any of the following patterns. Uh, you want to include a lot of information in your log lines, but if you want to include the file name of the author source with the percentage F, or use the qualified class name, line number or method name. As the 
Documentation also states these are expensive ways of looking up information for each log line, so better not use them. To conclude, here's a finding we had in a test where we saw very high response times uh, under load. The response times were sometimes higher than four seconds. Uh, when we looked into the code, we saw that there is a method to lock uh, the message context. Uh, so each time the lock message context method was called and a log level was provided, then first the create message as a string was called, which did a conversion of a byte array into a string. And with large messages, say 12 megabytes, uh, if you turn that byte array into a string array, then it will double. So we saw allocations of 24 megabytes. And then after the create message as a string, the service logger would be called with the log level. And only in the send log method, it would determine, oh, we should only log this at debug level. So we do not log the message. And the message was exposed again without being logged. So a lot of processing, high response times, and uh, for nothing. So by fixing this bug, we brought back the high response times to a couple of hundred milliseconds. So the key takeaway points of this presentation, go for minimal logging, but not uh, less than you need. Use the proper logging level, mostly on info. Always apply the conditional logging pattern, so you don't have a lot of two-string processing. Uh, prevent MDC, the so context leaking, by removing the values you put in in a finally block. You can use asynchronous logging to make things faster. We've seen tests where this will save up to 10% of resources. And avoid some of the heavy log configurations by printing out information that is handy but is not necessarily needed, like the uh, source location of where the log file is being called. Thank you, and I hope to see you in the next session. <laughs>